miss the knife being on your show? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <clears throat> no wall of shame for me. I'm gonna do this. Here we go. Hey, what's going on everybody? For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we close out season seven with Weird Al Yankovic. He's a four-time Grammy winner, a pop culture icon with more than 35 years in the game and he's not slowing down one bit either. Tickets are on sale now for his Strings Attached tour coming to a city near you in 2019. Weird Al, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Are you a spicy food guy? The world needs to know. <laughs> Not really. You know, I, I love uh, Indian food and Thai food and Mexican food, but I usually order it medium. So I, I'm not a big fan of the kind of food, the kind of spicy food that burns twice, if you know uh, what I mean. <laughs> I know what you mean all too well, Al. <laughs> Well, that's good. I approve. So your pathway into show business is not unlike the blueprint for many in 2018, whereby you have teenagers all over the globe making music in their bedrooms and hoping that it finds an audience. The difference between Weird Al and a SoundCloud rapper, of course, is that you didn't have the benefit of the internet in 1976. When you look at the song parody genre and how it's exploded on YouTube, when are you proud of this monster you've helped create? And then when do you feel shame? <laughs> yeah, I definitely came up in the pre-YouTube days and uh, there's a lot of people out there doing uh, comedy uh, videos and, and, and music parodies. And some people are doing it extremely well and some people not so much. And when I see somebody uh, that it seems like maybe I influenced them in some way and they're doing doing a great job. I take a lot of pride in that. And there are other times I look at the internet and say, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the internet is a place where it seems like facts have almost no value and you've experienced that in an extremely niche way. What's been the most annoying example of having to defend yourself against a parody song that's not even yours? Well, you, you can't police the internet. And, and in, in the Napster days, uh, every single song parody uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer sites were, uh, you know, oh, if it's a parody, it's Weird Al. Of course, it's Weird Al. Like, they, and some of them were like extremely profane. Some were racist. Some were just horrible. Some were all of the above, and it had my name attached to it. And some of that is around today. People, oh, I remember Al in the '90s who doing these horrible, racist, profane songs. And like, that, no, that was not me. Uh, but it, I became sort of like the the brand name. I was like the Xerox of parody music, like people just assumed, oh, if it's a parody, it's out. <laughs> okay, guajillo. Mm -hmm. My head hasn't fallen off yet, that's a good sign. Yeah. Okay. Very good, very right. good. I know that you got your first start in music when your parents signed you up for an accordion lesson, and here you are some 45 years later, still playing the instrument proudly. In the accordion, I feel like it's an instrument that gets a bad rap. You know, people lump it in with the bagpipes or the ukulele, <laughs> one of these things that doesn't get taken seriously. Do you think that that's unfair? In a way, uh, yeah, because the accordion is, uh, in, all, in all honesty, a very sensual instrument. Uh, I always talk about Dick Cantino, uh, who's a, a famous accordion player in the 50s, and uh, he was sort of a, a sex symbol, accordion player. I mean, you look at his album covers, and he has beautiful women draped on his legs, like, oh, play the accordion for us, you know, Dick Cantino. And I think in the 60s, uh, with Lawrence Welk, it became sort of like your grandma's music. and became sort of unhip. It really essentially was very dynamic, uh, uh, instrument, you know, the, the bellows create uh, the dynamics. You can be very, very soft, you can be loud with it. It, it flows, you know, um, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I, I think a lot of artists are now picking up on the back, oh, the accordion is not that bad. All right, here we go. What's this one now? The Maple Butterfly wood. Bakery Smoked Onions. Okay, here we go. Yep, getting a little. A little hotter. Inching what's, up. What's the Scoville on this? Oh, dropping Scoville on me, huh? <laughs> well, here we're in a very chill zone. 25,000, maybe even less. Okay, okay. Relax. Do you know about the Scoville scale, Al? Uh, uh, Aaron Scoville is one of my favorite singers. 
So throughout your career, you've always made it a point to clear your ideas with these artists that you spoof, which has created a whole mythology around some of these run-ins with high-profile musicians. What's been the most amusing interaction you've ever had when trying to get an artist's blessing? Um, when I first approached Kurt Cobain from Nirvana, if I could do a parody of Smells Like Teen Spirit, I called him over the phone when he was doing Saturday Night Live, and his immediate, uh, the first thing out of his mouth was, oh, great, is it gonna be a song about food? Because I was like the eat it guy, you know? Right. And I had to explain, it's, it's gonna be a song about how nobody can understand your lyrics. And he said, oh, that, sure, that's funny. Do you have a favorite Michael Jackson memory? Um, one time uh, I actually gave him a gold album for my album Even Worse, which had the fat song on it. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> he was very nice and gracious, but I imagine he just threw it on his pile of gold albums. Uh, but he was always very sweet, very nice, soft-spoken, um, uh, seemed to appreciate the parodies, he had a great sense of humor. Which was a prouder accomplishment for you, getting recognized by Paul McCartney at an industry party early on in your career, or having Kurt Cobain say that Nirvana really made it? When, oh. got, when they got parodied by Weird Al. It's hard to pick. I mean, you know, I, I'm hugely flattered uh, by both. But I mean, uh, when I met Paul McCartney for the first time in 1984 and he recognized me in a crowd, that blew my mind, I got to tell you, because I grew up as such a huge Beatles fan. And in fact, there's a, there's a video uh, from MTV where Martha Quinn is interviewing Paul McCartney and you kind of see my head <laughs> in the background <laughs> kind of bobbing up and, hey, hey! Uh, but yeah, it blew my mind. Like, uh, I was introduced myself finally to him and he said, I said, hi, uh, Mr. McCartney, my name's Al Yankovic. And he goes, oh, Weird Al. And he turns to Linda, look, honey, it's Weird Al. And my head exploded. It was just, I couldn't believe it. So this is a small Axe Peppers? Yes. Habanero mango. Habanero mango. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Okay. All right. I, I like how the uh, the whole point of this show is to uh, is to uh, <coughs> is to torture public figures. I, I, I'm going to give you this this idea for free. This is here's my pitch: invite I'm people on here. your show and just like just punch them in the face and ask them a question. <laughs> and every time they ask a question, just punch them again. You know, we're always talking about how we can continue to up the ante. I think that I would think work. That's a good idea. You can have that for free. I appreciate that, Al. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> well, you know, in your latest box set, it has more studio albums than the Beatles, and some of your parodies have outperformed the songs that inspired them in the first place. And I wonder, do you ever get existential as to <laughs> why? <laughs> no, but let's start right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I always think, not to lead the witness at all, but if we're just having this sort of existential conversation, you know, maybe people connect with something like Jon Stewart and The Daily Show more than the regular news because we live in such an absurd existence that maybe people are connecting with the comedy in a way that they don't with like just the straight real thing or something. I have to I have to say there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, I get a lot of my news from uh, from watching like late night show monologues. It's a, a more pleasurable way to get your information, you know, so I, there's a lot of truth to that, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, 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 I'm glad that my hair is not on fire yet. I thought I thought I would spontaneously combust by this point, but I'm, I'm hanging in there so far. All right, well, you know, we still have some wings to I know, go. I know, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not getting cocky. I'm not getting cocky, believe me. All right, Al, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram, where we do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. So I'll bust out the laptop. Okay. I'll show you the picture. You just tell me the bigger okay. story. Does that okay. sound good? Sure, what are we looking right. at? Laptop, please. All right, first things first. Do you ever get used to things like this? Uh, how could you? How could you possibly get used to that? No, every, every uh, that that was on my last tour, which was the ridiculously self-indulgent, ill-advised vanity tour, and that brought out the most hardcore fans. And this guy is obviously a pretty hardcore fan. That was That's probably the biggest Weird Al tattoo that I've seen. It's mind-boggling. I've seen uh, people doing uh, uh, references to my movie UHF. Uh, there was a couple that got tattoos, tattoos of spatulas uh, on their stomachs uh, because there's a line in the movie that says, what better way to say I love you than with the gift of a spatula? So they got a matching spatula tattoos. That's sweet. And then they broke up like six months later. But, <laughs> but at the time, it was very sweet. Here 
<laughs> we oh, have man. a Wheel of Fortune throwback for the ages. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was pretty surrealistic. Uh, I was asked to be on Celebrity Wheel of Fortune. My manager called me up and said, you want to do this show? And I said, Celebrity Wheel of Fortune? No, nah, I don't know. That sounds pretty cheesy. I don't think I want to do that. And he said, well, it, w- it would be with uh, Little Richard and James Brown. And I said, I'm there. <laughs> Get me on the plane. Uh, so yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. I, I don't think that either one of them really knew how to play the game. We, we had all gone through our rehearsal and we all you know, had spun the wheel and gone through, you know, everything you go through to prepare for the game. And James Brown shows up, uh, you know, half an hour late with his entourage and he wanted to still practice the game. So we're in the green room watching on a monitor and we're learning, watching James Brown learn to play Wheel of Fortune. Uh, and it's pretty obvious that he had never even played Hangman before. He had just no concept whatever <laughs> of, of this game. So he spins the wheel and he goes, okay, give me a, give me a, give me a A. And the producer says, no, James, when, when you spin the wheel, you have to pick a consonant. And he goes, oh, uh, Europe. <laughs> and it didn't get much better after that. A psalm? Mm-hmm. A psalm. All right. It wouldn't be a Hot Ones interview unless we got extremely granular about your obsession with snacks. <laughs> For our uncivilized viewers out there, can you give the origin story of the Twinkie Wiener sandwich and provide a do-it-at-home recipe for the people? Um, I'm not. It came out of my sick brain. I'm not sure what inspired it, uh, but it's, it was popularized on my movie UHF. And basically, what you do here's the recipe: you take a uh, a generic Twinkie and you split it long ways as if it were a hot dog bun. And then you put a hot dog, regular hot dog or tofu wiener, whatever you want to do, you put that inside the the Twinkie. And then um, you use spray cheese, easy cheese, whatever it is, but it has to come out of a spray can. And you spray the cheese on top of the, the hot dog. And for extra added bonus, you can just dunk it in your milk. You know, that's a big debate on what kind of cheese to use, at least according to the internet. So I'm happy that you set that straight because some people are like, you have to use Velveeta. Some people get like kind of fancy with it, but you're saying no. As long as it comes out of a spray can, that's okay. (laughs) Fire water, oh, okay, all right. This is starting to get a little scary. Yeah, that that's hot. That is getting hot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is scovalicious. <laughs> so I've heard you describe yourself as a pop culture Cuisinart, and you've had to have your fingers on the pulse to find inspiration for these right pop culture moments. I want to take a look at some of the finer notes of your highest charting song ever, which is White and Nerdy, because on paper, Chameleon Air, big rapper, but not the biggest, doesn't necessarily seem like somebody Weird Al would target. And then Riding Dirty, big song, not the biggest rap song. So can you talk about why you went in that direction and your understanding of why you think it worked? Um, sometimes, it, you know, if the, the idea is the most important thing. So if it's a really fun idea that lends itself to, to comedy, I mean, that's more important than anything else. I mean, I think the most important thing was 2006 when that came out, I think that was sort of like the tipping point for nerds. In, in a way, because I mean, like when I was in high school, you did not want to be a nerd. I mean, you, you sat at the nerd table and you were made fun of and you got beat up at, at recess. I mean, it was not a cool thing. And starting in 2006, people were like, you know what, nerds are not that bad. They make all the cool toys. They make all the shiny things we like to play with. And, and people are starting to like argue that they've got nerd cred which you never heard when I was in high school. That was not a thing. So about the time when I when I did White and Nerdy, that, that wave was kind of cresting. People were like all of a sudden going like, yeah, yeah, nerds, woo! Oh, this is the bomb. <laughs> this is beyond insanity. I, w- I was okay at insanity, but I don't know if I want to go beyond insanity. No one does, no one does. Okay, all right. Is this where it gets painful? Like I have a feeling this is gonna, okay. That's pretty hot. That's really hot. That is hot. That is the bomb. You know what? That is beyond insanity. No. Lest you think otherwise. Ah, now. Yes. Well. 
Is the knife being on your show? <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <clears throat> no wall of shame for me. I'm gonna do this. Here we go. So you've had incredible longevity by creating these humorous songs that are sneakily musical. So I'm curious about your perspective on other musicians who've blurred the line between comedy and music. What's the funniest rock song of all time in your opinion? Um, Mama get the hammer, there's a fly on the baby's head. That was, uh, I think that was, that was one of the biggest, funniest rock songs I've ever heard. Do you think Kanye West is a humor artist at all? Intentionally? Probably not. <laughs> it's hard to tell. I mean, he could be like the Andy Kaufman of music. Like, you never really know. Tenacious D, what's the distinguishing quality? Uh, they rock hard. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're all about the, the hot sauce. You've, you've had them on the show, mm -hmm. I know. Um, they're all so good in their own way. That's, that's, there's not, a, I mean, even though we all do comedy music, there's not a lot of crossover. We each have our own distinct thing that we do. What about with Flight of the Concords? Flight of the Concords, they are the best um, uh, New England folk duo I've ever heard. What about the Lonely Island? Lonely Island, th three of my close friends, and they, uh, they do every imaginable rap genre extremely well. Uh, I love those guys to death. Uh, what, what, what is this? Ex, ex Horesco? Uh oh. Does this make your hair turn into snakes? Is that what this does? Well, you've uh, you've beaten us to it, basically, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Ah! Okay. Okay. Excoresco. <laughs> oh. oh. Even getting, even getting close to it, I'm. Uh -huh. My eyes are watering. Okay. Oh. Why are you doing this to me? Why did you do this to me? <laughs> Why, Sean? We dig our I own thought we graves. were friends. We dig our own graves on top. I thought we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, your career is decades long, yes? pre-internet, post-internet, and always blazing a trail that's all your own, so we shouldn't be surprised to know that you have some unexpected highlights along the way. Is bringing someone to a movie that you're in- I can't even listen to you right now. Is what are you talking about? Is bringing someone to a movie that you're in and not telling them the <laughs> ultimate first date flex. <laughs> This, this is a story that's been going around the internet, and it's, it's absolutely true. When um, <laughs> when the Naked Gun first came out, we've been 88, I guess. Back in the uh, 80s, I was single, and I was going on a lot of dates, and I would take first dates to see the Naked Gun, and I'd wear the same shirt I was wearing, you know, coming off the plane in the movie, and I just loved their reaction when <laughs> that scene would come up, and they'd like do a double take, like, what? <laughs> I got a kick out of that. <laughs> What did it mean to you to be named to the Mustache Hall of Fame second inductee class? I wasn't sure I'm aware of that. So what? Uh, so what? What now? You're in the Mustache Hall of Fame wow. alongside Steve Prefontaine and Wyatt Earp. Uh, well, I'm, I'm extremely honored. Uh, I, I think it's one of my top 500 best honors ever. <laughs> and I'm, I, 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 gosh, thank you so much. Thank you, Hall of Fame mustache people. There's a big online push to get you to play a Super Bowl halftime show. It's not up to me. I know, but I am curious. <laughs> is that of any bucket list interest to you? And have you ever had any fantasy about what it would look like? Let me put it this way. Uh, if they offered it, which they are not, I'm never going to be on the NFL shortlist. But if they offered it, obviously I wouldn't turn it down. You can't do that. But I would have just nonstop explosive diarrhea for five months. <laughs> Which doesn't sound like a lot of fun. It's like going into politics. Like the Super Bowl is so big. If you if you're doing something like that, there's going to be a million people that hate you, no matter who you are. Like you know, you, you see the most amazing Super Bowl performance ever, and you go online like, oh, that was awful. I can't believe. I've never you know. People get really upset, and um, I, I I don't like being hated. You know. <laughs> so part of me was like, oh, this is a great opportunity, and part of me was like, I don't know if I want to have that much hate in my life. Uh, are we there? Okay, what am I doing? I mean... <laughs> All right, Weird Al, this okay. is the last dab. We call it the last dab because it's tradition around here to put a little extra on the last wing. But it's optional, right? You don't have to if you don't want Why to. Why would I want to? Because <laughs> you've made it this far. Oh, that, that by itself is incredible, okay. 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 Here we go, Here Al. We go. What a run it's been. Uh. 
Thank you, Sean. Thank may, you, Al. Thank you. May I have another? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Weird Al, here we are at the end of our bizarre, macabre, vegan lunch together. And when we closed out season six, we had John Mayer in this seat, and we touched ukes, and we did a ukulele duet to send the people off. So here on season seven, it would be such a blessing if we could do the same time, but this time with our toy <laughs> accordions. Wait a minute, this is not a standard 120 bass model. You've made... So many waves over the years with your solos. And it would be such an honor if you could hit us with one while we're here at the table. I'm here to accompany in case you need me. This may not be my best solo ever, but I'll give it my best shot. It might be though too. It might be. Closing it out, and before we go, I just want to say happy holidays to all the Spice Lords from those of us here at Hot Ones. You have no idea how much your love and support really fuels the show and everybody who works so hard to make it happen. And I want to thank you, Weird Al, for giving Season 7 the send-off that it deserves. And now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you, my friend. This camera, this camera, or this camera. Okay. Let the people know what you have oh, going on so many choices. Life. Uh, all right, um... Well, uh, as you mentioned, I'm doing the Strings Attached Tour next summer. Uh, tickets are available right now as we speak, this very moment, at WeirdAl.com. What better way to say happy holidays than with Weird Al tickets? <laughs> See? See? Sean knows what I'm talking about. That's right. <laughs> Good job, Al. Good job. Yay! Yay. Happy holidays, Spice Lords. This is Sean Evans checking in with a very important hot sauce announcement. The Hot Ones monthly subscription box is back in 2019 and at a reduced cost of $30. You'll still get three hot sauces every month curated by Heatonist and be the first to get Hot Ones hot sauce releases. Whether you want to treat yourself or get a gift for that special spicy someone, you know the drill. Heatonist.com, Heatonist.com to sign up and order. Don't make me eat all this hot sauce alone. Who appreciates the Spice Lords? I do, damn it. <laughs>